Hey, what's up? It's Jesko from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. Now, if you're moving to a new room or maybe just switching rooms because you got options for a new one, you've probably seen a video of mine about optimizing room dimensions or you've just read somewhere that you really need to have a particular ratio of room dimensions. So now you've got options to move a wall or put in a new wall or reduce the ceiling height a bit. And you're wondering, is it actually worth it? Should you go through with it in your particular room, in your particular scenario that you're dealing with? As always, the answer is, it depends. In this video, I wanna show you some examples to see what that actually looks like and what key things, what particular things you need to pay attention to in order to make that decision. So just a quick recap, we optimize room dimensions or optimize the ratio of dimensions of our room in order to get an even spread of standing waves across the low end that steadily decreases as we go up in frequency. That way we don't end up with huge holes or peaks in the frequency spectrum because there are certain standing waves missing in a part of the spectrum or maybe they pile up in another part of the spectrum, right? So for example, here we've got some arbitrary room that I just put in, the room mode calculator, right? And we've got this graph that shows us the low end of the spectrum, the frequency response, and each of these lines represents one standing wave in this room. And they're fairly evenly spread out. As we go up in frequency, we get one after the other, and they kind of slowly increase or the number increases or the spread decreases as we go up in frequency, right? And that way we have this even spread where we have kind of standing wave or room mode support at uh, regular intervals, which means that we can end up having a relatively even low end frequency response. Because otherwise it would look something like this. Now here is a poor uh, ratio of dimensions so we have standing waves that aren't evenly spread across the low end, across the spectrum, and we get this one here at the very beginning, but then we get a huge hole with no standing wave, and then we get a few of them, and then there's this, this little area where there are two piling up on top of each other, and there's another one here where there are two piling up on, on top of each other, and another one here. And so in with this particular ratio of dimensions, we might expect to some extent that the low end response will be quite uneven with potentially a big dip, a big hole in energy in this area between 40 something and 60 something Hertz. And then perhaps some higher peaks where they pile up and add on top of each other at here around in this case, 75 Hertz and maybe 104 Hertz or something. Now, if you wanna watch me go through this process of actually optimizing these dimensions and kind of how to do it in practice, have a look at this video that I'm linking in the card right now. By the way, just quickly, something that I often see people getting confused about is which dimensions this refers to. And what we're talking about here are the outermost solid surfaces of your room, right? It doesn't matter whether you put in treatment into the room, onto the walls or under the ceiling or wherever afterwards. What we're talking about here are the dimensions of the empty room. What you then do inside the room doesn't really matter for this particular concept. And that leads me nicely to my next point, which is that if you're trying to make a calculator like this work for your particular room, you always have to remember that it's based on an ideal room model. So basically a shoebox shaped, a square room, which is basically a bunker. So like the walls, the surfaces are 100% reflective. But in reality, in practice, no room is a perfect square concrete bunker, right? Or at least hardly any of them are. So the exact order, the pattern of standing waves will be different in reality in your room in comparison to what this calculator spits out, right? So wall, ceiling, floor materials, doors, windows, all of these things that change the overall shape of the room and also affect how reflective all the surfaces are, they will all change, they will all affect the actual frequencies 
of where these standing waves sit in the frequency spectrum. So like if one wall is just pure brick or concrete even, and then the other side is maybe just a single layer of flimsy drywall, and then obviously you have a door and then maybe a big window somewhere, I can guarantee that the actual pattern, the actual order of standing waves that you get in the spectrum is going to be quite different to what the calculator says. So you always have to take these calculators with a grain of salt, right? In your typical home studio in a spare bedroom or a basement or an attic, it's an interesting exercise to go through, but that's about it, right? It's not useless per se, but the use of these calculators for a typical home studio scenario are pretty limited. So that means if you want to make changes to the dimensions of your room and you want it to actually work as predicted, there are basically two things you got to watch out for. So first of all, the room has to be square shaped, right? You got to stick to that shoebox shape because otherwise this calculator isn't going to work, right? None of this angled wall nonsense. You're just going to make your life really difficult because it be basically becomes unpredictable what actually happens in the low end. And second, you need to make all the surfaces in your room as solid, as reflective as possible, right? There's no point in putting in a single new wall made out of a single layer of drywall, yeah? That's just asking for trouble. At the very least, you need a double layer of drywall. And by the way, this also counts for the ceiling. You can't just put in like one of those flabby suspended ceilings and expect it to basically reflect sounds so that these predictions still work, right? Low frequencies are just going to pass through that, that flimsy suspended ceiling and are actually going to ref get, uh, get reflected off of the first really solid barrier they encounter, which is probably going to be the actual ceiling above your suspended ceiling, right? So you always have to make sure that all the walls, all the ceilings, the floor, they're as reflective as you can possibly make them. They have to be solid and heavy in order to properly reflect low frequencies and actually make these calculators work. So taking this back into the practical world, that means when you're thinking about putting in a new wall, you always have to consider just the, the very practical implications of cost and time involved and how much work it takes to do this, right? You want it, if, if you want this to work as predicted, you have to do it right, right? You can't just go halfway and then expect it to work. And at that point, it's probably not worth it. So the final thing to consider here is just the overall size of the room that you end up with once you've actually optimized those dimensions. So what I've got here is an actual example of when that's the case. So this is an, an actual room that one of my friends and followers sent me today, wondering whether he should switch to this new room. Uh, it's about seven meters something long, about two meters 50 wide, and just above two meters long, uh, high, sorry. And he's he basically has the option to shorten the length of the room. He can't really do much about the width or the height, but he could put in a new wall to make the room shorter, right? And as it is right now, there's this big hole down here, right? And we've got like some piles of, or some frequencies where standing waves kind of pile up. Not ideal, yeah? The bolt area shows us that it's not ideal as well because the cross is actually even outside the graph, yeah? So we could try and optimize the length of this room, yeah? And if you go through these numbers, you'll quickly find that the only option he really has is to make this room really, really small. At this point, purely from a standing wave perspective, this room is optimized, but it's tiny. Three meters 20 long, obviously two, me two, two meters 50 wide and just above two meters high. There's hardly any space left to put any treatment in this room. Otherwise, with this tiny room, things are gonna end up really, really small and really cramped. You could get it to work, but is it better than the other option? Probably not. And that brings me to my final point, which is that no matter what you do, whether you work with the room as is or you optimize its dimensions, that's not a substitute for finding the, the best listening position, the ideal listening position in the room where you get the most balanced low end. Because if you want to have any chance at all at getting a full 
punchy, tight, balanced low end that actually lets you properly judge the, the bass balance in your mix, you have to make sure you sit at your room's low end sweet spot. Otherwise, you'll just be fighting an uphill battle, no matter how much treatment you put in the room. Unfortunately, you can't just arbitrarily pick a listening position because it seems right and then hope that somehow the treatment is going to take care of the low end balance. And that's true even if you're working with general like rules of thumb like facing the short side and being positioned at 38% of the room's length. These rules of thumb work in theory, but they're based on assumptions that usually don't pan out in the real world, aka your room is a shoebox that is 100% reflective. I regularly get emails from people who tell me they lack punch, they lack low-end presence and detail, low-end extension at their listening position. They've done all this treatment already, they've experimented with subs, and none of it helped. And the simple reason is, is they're not placed, they're not sat at their low end sweet spot. And oftentimes at that point, it's too late. They've put in all this work already, they've got all their treatment in, they've got their big desk in there, and they can't really move the listening position anymore. And at that point, all I can say is, yeah, sorry, like, unfortunately you prioritized the wrong thing as you were starting out. You really gotta make sure that you're sat at your room's low end sweet spot. But remember, you don't get to pick that position. Your room dictates where it is depending on the actual pattern of standing waves. It's your job to find it and above everything else, make sure you're sat there once your speakers, your desk, once everything is in place. Now, in order to find your room's low end sweet spot, I have developed the Bass Hunter technique, which you can download for free at the link in the description below. It's basically a structured listening test that walks you through analyzing your particular room standing wave pattern so that you can make sure you're actually sat in the exact spot where you get the best low end balance. That gives you the ideal starting point to build your studio, to build up your room and also put in treatment because that way the treatment doesn't have to work to fix the low end balance. It literally just has to improve what you've already got. So again, no matter what ratio of dimensions you're working with, you always got to make sure that you're sitting in your room's low end sweet spot and that's where your listening position is located. So download the free guide to the Bass Hunter technique and figure out where that is in your actual room. All right, as always, thanks for watching. I hope that answered your question whether you should optimize your room's dimensions in your particular case. I'll see you in the next video.